Welcome to Truest Blood, the official True Blood podcast. I'm Kristen Bauer. And I'm Deborah Ann Wool. And you've been invited in. I want to do bad things, man. Welcome back to Truest Blood, where we sink our fangs into the series episode by episode. This week's episode is entitled Shake and Finger Pop, written by Alan Ball and directed once again by the great Michael Lehman. There is a lot of fun happening in this episode, and it feels like a good time to take a step back and look at how the story is being captured. Mm -hmm. We'll discuss all of your favorite moments, but then we're going to revisit with the help of our lead camera operator, Simon Jays, to discuss the different ways the camera is used to capture the story just right. And adding on to that, we have the phenomenal cinematographer and director, Romeo Tarone, with us this week to add his expertise to the picture. Literally. The cinematographer collaborates with the director using the lighting and camera movement to create just the right mood for the scene. And it's a really delicate and profound art form. And Romeo is one of the best. There's so much to cover. So without further ado, this week on True Blood. Fangs bared, Bill backs Hoyt to the door, but turns out Hoyt isn't who he's worried about. I wasn't gonna do nothing. It's not her that I'm protecting, son. After a last longing look between Hoyt and Jess, he leaves. Luckily, Jess and Sookie are able to talk some sense into Bill and all three head off to Dallas. But this little family trip immediately turns sour when not a moment after they land, their driver attempts to kidnap Sookie. But Bill and an eager-to-learn Jessica glamour the kidnapper into submission. Back at church camp, Jason is quickly moving up the ranks. Despite tension with his bunkmates, he is promoted to a soldier of the sun with extra special accommodations, a bedroom just down the hall from the preacher and his wife. Meanwhile, a worried Tara visits Lafayette, but he only wants to be left alone. If you die, I'm going to be really pissed. Well, that makes the two of us. That night, Eric shows up and makes Lafayette an offer he cannot refuse, his blood. In Dallas, Bill and Sookie begin their investigations and reveal the kidnapper works for the Fellowship of the Sun. And it is these humans that are keeping the powerful Godric captive. Now that is what worries me. If one such as he can be taken by humans, then none of us is safe. Back in Bon Tom, we find Tara crying over a lot more than spilled milk. It turns out it's her birthday, and she is alone. But Marianne, Carl, and Eggs surprise her at Sookie's with a cake and plans for one hell of a party. This being Marianne, things heat up fast, and Tara and Eggs head to the bedroom. Party escalates from dancing and writhing to frenzied feeding and fighting. And finally, we see Marianne let out the beast as long talons extend from her arms in place of her hands. Sam and Daphne take the opportunity to get to know one another better, and she lets out a little secret. I know what you are. But he's not the only one outed this episode, as Sookie happens upon Barry the bellboy, who just so happens to be another telepath. So one of the funny moments we can start with, you know, we have Jason in the new lens, but it, I sort of, my mind tracked it backwards yeah. because I thought I always love Ryan's behavior. <laughs> so when he hits the ketchup out of the guy's hand, right, in this mock you know, yes, thing that they set him up with where they, that he gets into. Yeah. Yeah. They all fake yeah. that they're killed by vampires. And I'm like, why was the guy standing there holding ketchup? <laughs> and then I realized, oh, what a great detail. Yes. 
so well, even amazing. Even he has this clip-on tie as well. Like it's not a real tie. It's just so perfection. <laughs> Jason Stack has Audrey, Audrey on top of her game. Also, yes. an interesting note: we talked about continuity last episode. You'll notice in this scene, Jason's second button goes from being unbuttoned to buttoned. You oh. probably didn't notice because the acting was Chef's kiss. But that's a, yes. an example of a continuity error not making much of a difference because the scene is so good. Right. But we also have Jason oh the my philosopher. <laughs> All these guys philosophizing yes, about and good Jason and evil and God. Kills yeah. it. So Jesus made the first vampire. Maybe Jesus was the first vampire. I mean, he rose from the dead too. And he told people, hey y'all, drink my blood. It'll give you special powers. Jesus. <laughs> it's so right brilliant. on. Right. There is so much in this. I mean, I'm, this is Alan Ball writing this. So, I mean, you can already hear <sighs> these are things I'm sure Alan has thought his entire life. You know, these are this is Alan yes. getting an opportunity to share some of the the weird <laughs> thoughts he's had throughout his totally. life. Yeah. Observations. Right. And that other good one where the, Luke says, you know, God will make sure evil is punished. <laughs> and Jason and his parting line, yes. which does stump them. He says, oh, yeah, then explain yes. Europe to me. And 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 Luke thinking that it's called evil because Eve committed the first sin. Oh, it's so great. And Jason's even like, it's that's just, just stepping over the line. Like he defends Eve and you're like, yes, Jason. Right. I know. Again, Jason is looking like the, what did I write in my notes? So like it was something evolved, like Jason and his simplicity. His simplicity yes, he's is the very evolved, evolved, profound yes. one. <laughs> it's so, so then good. we get into target practice with Steve Newland. And Steve yes. admires Jason so much. And, and oh, I mean, he has that line towards the end of it where he, you can just tell Steve Newland is like Jones in for that first vampire. Yeah. Film. He's so jealous mm -hmm. that Ryan saw someone turn yeah. to goo. Yeah. And then we have another of like one of the most favorite moments of everyone <laughs> for this season is Jason's country music video fantasy of Sarah Newland yeah. as she's cooking ribs. I mean, it's in we t asked her about it in the interview so, yes. that we're going to have in the next episode. Yes, right? we did. It's so good. <laughs> I, I, and I don't even want to spoil that interview because she talks about going for it and mm -hmm. filming that. And I also love how Ryan plays the looks where he's in his fantasy head, but listening yes. to Reverend Newland. Yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, he's trying to deny that that's what's going on, uh, you know, within him. And, right. and it's interesting because then right. the boys in camp sort of tease him for that. And when it's, when it's revealed that he's going to be spending the night, you know, spending his nights mm -hmm. at the, at the manse, <laughs> at the Newland manse, the manse. they mm -hmm. suggest that it's just because she is attracted to him. Wants a toy. So he has to sort of fight those feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're going to be getting into camera work a little bit here. You'll notice at the top of that scene yeah. with Sarah and Jason in his bedroom, our shot is on Jason. But in the reflection of the glass behind him, we see her enter in her nightie. And it's just a really nicely Ooh, set up shot Deb, good yeah eye. so it's something else to to keep an eye on and we also have the poor tara, poor tara man oh Aww. my heart again i know we wanted to be real for Ugh. her we we know that marianne is dangerous but we just want her to poor tara well, you know she does such a good job of standing up for herself and moving out to go live at sookies which is you know a, a real family mm -hmm. but Still, yeah. she's alone. I always cry on my birthday. It's always the worst day. No matter what I do, I end up crying. Because my birthday always sucks. Well, this is the year that changes. I promise you that. Oh, oh. oh dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Writers are They're cruel. They're so mean to us, aren't they? <laughs> And so you know mean. what's a particularly mean moment is is Letty yeah. May showing up at Merlot's. Oh, it's such a that is a heartbreaker. Oh, it's such a a big gesture from her. Mm -hmm. And a part of what I love too, I mean, again, Sam Trammell being such a good actor, she, you know, Letty May asks Sam, "Is he still dating her?" And he says no, and he looks so mm -hmm. ashamed that he mm -hmm. didn't treat her right. That he has to admit to her mother. Oh, it's so good. I know I love the beats in that because then he turns to Arlene because yeah. she's, you know, being gossipy yes. and he goes, you can go. Then he goes right back yeah. to what he's dealing with. I also just as a little 
texted her to myself was like, oh my gosh, she wrapped the gift in tinfoil. <laughs> well, at least like that just seems so it's southern. very, yes, it's very, you know, uh, use what you have <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. And it's a smart thing because then it stands yep. out on the pile of yep. gifts and Marianne throws it oh, in the bushes. I mean, out loud, I'm watching that. I went, oh, bitch, you know, like I just, <laughs> oh, <laughs> And again, like, it's like everything is set up and staged to make Mm -hmm. Tara need her. Mm -hmm. Mom didn't send you a gift, but I threw you a party. Oh, in a pile of gifts from people she doesn't know. know, Right. I mean, Tara admits she's like, I don't know who these people are. And, and, you know, something you wrote in your notes and I wrote in my notes is how Rutina (laughs) is such such a great dancer. dancer. And um, she had actually just recently posted something on Instagram, which sent me down a little research route. But both of her parents are professional dancers. So, I mean, you can really see that, you know, dance and performance is it's in Rutina's blood. It's in her experience in her life. And and she just shines in this show in general, but obviously in this moment. Yeah. And Tara and A finally getting together. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I mean, it's definitely a better birthday, but then those eyes. Oh, that poor Terry. I know. I think every year she goes through a lot. That actress just <laughs> kills it. Every, every season, season Rutina they know they can put her tasked with the impossible and she makes it sing. So <laughs> and the other same yes. Nelson Ellis, speaking of making it oh, sing. Goodness. I mean, are you kidding me? The scene with oh. Eric? Well, so they're both, I mean, two powerhouse performances. I yeah. love that Eric, you know, that Alex leans in, he places his hands, you I know, he can't that. come in, but he is, it is so clear that he can cross the boundary still. It's super scary. I thought that was a bold move. I mean, I really, as a viewer was like, oh, you can yeah. do that. You can put your arm into that space. And, and it got me thinking like how predatory yes. and how powerful he is and how, You know, we had that incredible acting moment with Nelson last episode where he is Mm. crying in the blanket and he's been tortured. And then how vulnerable he Mm. is with this arm coming through the window and his leg is rotting. He's got no choice. No choice. And I I, I love this exchange. Bullshit. You want to be able to keep track of me. Why? You obviously mean something to Suki. And what Suki finds meaningful, I find curious i love that he chose the word yes. curious because we really are wondering what is this thing with suki and yes. eric what's his deal and then yes and then our favorite yeah. I, we have to highlight this because <laughs> we, i mean there wasn't anything that Nelson couldn't do i mean he could just make yeah. any yeah. moment better than it ever was on the page or in anyone's imagination and yeah. so always lafayette Dancing while high on V, <laughs> on Eric's blood specifically. <laughs> yes. I mean, you laugh out loud, but it's also so grounded yes. and his dancing is impressive and it's just. Yes. Like how, firing on I all cylinders. I mean, it, firing on all cylinders. That is so incredible. And then juxtaposition to Alex, who's like, <laughs> how you feeling? Right. Very understated. I'm really happy for you. <laughs> it's so good. It's so excellent, good. Excellent scene. And then, yeah, then we have the whole sort of Compton family goes to Dallas <laughs> story. Oh, my gosh. You know, we start at the Compton home. We have sort of the the wrap up of the Hoyt and Jess moment. I like yeah. that Hoyt still believes in her. There's just that little bit. Yeah. And the, the little thing I'll share from this is that I had actually entirely lost my voice that day. Wow. I did not have anything to give. Oh my I mean, God. when I spoke, it was like this. I couldn't <gasps> get anything out. So just to do that speech, which of course for me as a young actor on the show, I was like, I have to nail this. So yeah. anytime they were not shooting, I was in the corner doing vocal warm ups, just trying to keep my throat loose and open. And I oh just eked that speech out with the last little bit that I got. I was so afraid that they were going to make me ADR it. Thank God they didn't oh. because I actually think. I found something in that moment that was worth preserving. You did. And it is interesting that you say that because I was watching this going, is her voice kind of 
And then I thought, well, I thought I heard something. I wasn't sure if it was the emotion, if it was the, yeah. you know, previous part of the scene. But like, you did nail it. <laughs> Thanks. You did it, Deb. You well, did this is, it. You know, again, it goes back to that continuity conversation. Whereas we could say, well, yeah. her voice doesn't match. But if the right. performance and the emotion of the scene and the story we're telling, mm -hmm. if that's captured, then it's sort of mm -hmm. better not to mess with it. This is mm -hmm. evidence of how... TV shows are made. This is this is this is mm -hmm. like finding pottery buried in a tomb. You know, this is this is evidence. It's, it, is. it doesn't have to be an error. It can be an opportunity. So it's cool. That's it. And then we get something interesting, which is, you know, again, we've spoken about how any analogy or metaphor that True Blood is playing with is never a one for one. Right. But this is a moment here where Bill talks about the difference for him when he was made a vampire and mm -hmm. for Jessica at this point in time. It's so different for her. When I was made, one had no choice but to live completely outside the human world. As an outlaw. A hunter. Humans were prey and nothing else. I envy her. Oh my God, we love Bill slash We Steven. do, and you know, I think... In this case, you know, much like, you know, the LGBT community may express, there's this how things mm -hmm. change over time that, you yes. know, in many ways, Bill couldn't live openly and proudly as a vampire and Jessica perhaps right. can. And so, again, while right. it's not a one to one, it gives us this opportunity to talk about something that is a little greater than just a vampire story, which is always really special. Yes, I love that so much. That's when you have writers like yeah. Alan and all the writers we yeah. had and the support of HBO. I think so. And yeah, last but not least, we have Bill teaching Jess to glamour. Um, it's very sweet. It's very and, sweet. And uh, very kind of, you know, you in watching it, I was like, oh, I feel glamoured. <laughs> yes, I did too. I was, I had in my notes, like, I think that Deb just glamored me <laughs> in my living room. Over here, room. listen to Bill, because the way Steve does this, I think Steve may actually be a vampire. Here, leaning close so you could catch his gaze and just let everything go. Let yourself be dead. You feel it? You are empty, a vacuum. Now you can pull his mind into yours. Oh, and I could really hear the sound playing yes. it back while we're recording is that they put in the Nathan heartbeat. Nathan and Gary in post-production, yeah. Yeah, that was cool. And the swishy, glamoury sound at the end It helps there. a lot, doesn't it? It helps a lot. Yeah. You don't realize all the things that are working on you to suck you in when you're watching a show because there's so much going into your well, senses. Well, there's so much visually right that now, arrests you that yeah, when visually, you listen right. to it now, you're right, so much more. You go, oh, there's all these things that mm -hmm. are helping mm -hmm. focus this story. Yeah, it's a huge yeah. team creating this, yeah. this world. Well, wonderful. And now for a quick bite. Guest star spotlight, Dean Norris. So you may recognize Leon the limo driver this episode. He was a series regular on one of the best and most loved dramas in the history of television. For five seasons, he played DEA agent Hank Schrader on AMC's Breaking Bad. Now, I can remember when we filmed our stuff together uh, in this episode, and he was talking about how he had just shot a new series. It hadn't come out yet, but he was really excited about it. Little did we know it was Breaking Bad and that it would be the hit that it was. Wow. And he is also a big brain. He was high school valedictorian, then went on to Harvard, where he performed with the famous Hasty Pudding Theatricals, a burlesque musical organization that boasts John Adams, both Roosevelt's, Jack Lemmon, Rashida Jones, and JFK among its alumni, and whose graduates have gone on to create some of your favorite entertainments, such as Hairspray, The Daily Show, Legally Blonde the Musical, and of course, Breaking Bad. And 
And now we get to share some of our conversation with the Simon Jays. Yay. I love Simon. Yay. Oh my gosh. Our remarkable A camera operator for all seven seasons. He also directed an episode in the seventh season. That's right. That's right. So you'll be hearing snippets from Simon all about his life working behind the camera. And, you know, we'll get into all the details of the camera department at some point. They all Mm -hmm. have fascinating jobs. But the camera operator is the literal human being behind the lens. And, you know, outside of having the knowledge to operate many different types of camera equipment, they also are going to work really closely with the cinematographer to frame the shot and select lenses. There's also a management aspect to it because you're managing the whole camera team and making sure that everything gets set up correctly. Yeah, people don't realize there's a whole team there. There's a guy who moves the dolly. There's a guy who does the focusing. And Simon was an exceptional cameraman to have because he was also a steady cam operator and techno crane operator. Amazing. Yeah, is three in one. He's like a transformer. <laughs> so the steady cam, in case you you know don't know or can't picture it, it's a body rig that allows the operator to basically wear the camera and move about the scene freely. So it stabilizes the camera, isolating it from the operator's movement, so he can do smooth tracking, and you don't have to lay any tracks or floor down like you would for more traditional camera setups. Yep. And the techno crane. Oh my gosh. I wish I could Vulcan (laughs) mind meld this to our listeners because it's insane. It's insane. It's massive. So it is a techno crane. Crane. It is a massive piece of camera gear. It's a crane with a camera on the end of this long arm that telescopes out and back with remote control, it, it creates this smooth, sweeping, tracking shots, all controlled by the camera operator. Yeah, and in fact, the only reason that we use Technocrane in Hollywood at all is because our friend, Simon Jays, who mm-hmm. you're going to hear from in a minute, brought the know-how with him from the UK in the 1980s. He is cited. It's on Wikipedia. You can find it. <laughs> um, you know, He was part of the team that developed the original technology and then introduced it to the United States in films like True Lies and The Doors and Batman and Robin and JFK. I mean, just we owe Simon so much in this industry. We do. We love him. It was so lovely to reconnect with Simon, and so quickly we fell right back into talking about just what a pleasure it was to work with him. Yeah, and I realize he's probably my closest relationship from that seven years, because we did scenes with different people in different locations and different directors, but every take, we also had another camera crew, right? But, Mm -hmm. But really mainly, I was right there looking at Simon, I had to hit my mark, he, he talks about this. He had to know all our lines. Yeah. I had to check with him. If the camera didn't catch what I did, it was on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in many ways, the camera operator knows you better than anyone else as an right. actor. You know, he's there every day staring at you. He knows all your tics. And yes. especially as a steady cam operator who's literally in the scene with you at that point. Yeah. Now, when you're doing these steady cam shots, any shot, but mm-hmm. I thought of it when you mentioned steady cam because you have to know who's going to speak next. So, how familiar do you also have to be with the scene, the dialogue? Oh, you have you have to be absolutely. I mean, that's the, 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 crazy. You, 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 and and I I love that, and that's where I think that I would develop a relationship with actors more than yes. a, a regular camera operator because I I'm, I, I'm basically in the scene at that point. Yeah. Yes. And just to, who's going through the door first? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right. like, and right. it's st- stuff like that. And that's great because I, I love it. It's great. After working with the same, because we mentioned working with the same cinematographers and directors, working with the same actors over seven years, yeah. do you learn our habits? Our Absolutely. Do we turn right or left more and, often? And, or, and yeah. we have nicknames for all of you. Oh, but no. This, <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell us what they are. <laughs> there was for Sam. He's, he's not a shapeshifter. He's a hip shifter because he would do this. <laughs> and... To explain that rather than see it, he he would he would shift his weight oh from one foot to goodness. the other so much that he'd be out of frame. Uh, oh. So <laughs> oh, that have is to go with that. so <laughs> funny. I love that. It makes me laugh so hard that Sam, <laughs> the shapeshifter, so was actually the 
hip shifter. That's so cute. I mean, that's how tight it is with the camera because yeah. they would say to you, lean a little on your left hip. It's like half an inch sometimes you're, yes. you're really threading that needle. So that's so um, cute. He's the hip shifter. He's the hip shifter. But, you know, that's an amazing relationship there. And I, you know, there are other sets that I've been on where if you were to have that kind of communication with a camera operator, mm. cinematographer or director, somebody would feel like you were going around them or, mm. you know, above them. And it's another reason why this set was so special, because yeah. if Simon needed to ask me to shift a little bit or I needed to say, hey, can I have a beat longer to get to this moment? We could right. have that conversation. And so, you know, again, it really made working with him and on the set, um, an exceptional experience. So special, so special. And, you know, he commented on something that I wouldn't have seen. So this moment where he, it's the scene with you and Hoyt in Merlots and what it was like for him to watch you in this scene and how much he remembers it and was thrilled by it. He brought it right up. Going to Deb one day, she just did the scene where she has to walk into Malotz yeah. as, a, as a vampire. Yeah. And it's all slow-mo. Oh, that's and such And at the shock. end, I said to her, you're going to get a lot of fan mail. And she was, no, I don't, I want, no. And here we go. You know. That is such a magical, beautiful scene. And she is absolutely breathtaking. Yeah. It, it's that th th there's uh, th there was another one in Fantasia, like a few seasons later, but it was um, yeah. that I was, it, it's great as a camera operator to see that, that oh, moment yeah. happening, you know, where she became a star. I mean, it's like, well done, Deb. So. Oh, it was so, that's so sweet of him that he remembers yeah. that and thinks of that. And, you know, I'm just touched that we shared that moment together. Me too. Together. I'm glad your power went out so you we know. could gush about you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I didn't have to blush too hard in the moment. Exactly. You know, and so there are wonderful moments like that. And then there are also incredible challenges to this job. And actually, Simon shared a few with us, very True Blood specific <laughs> ones that I, you know, hadn't really considered Me before. Me either. By halfway through, though, we used so yeah. much smoke on the set yeah. that over the weeks and months that you do it, 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 it would just keep basically uh, layering on the optics of the camera. Yes. And I would have to send it in to get it all clean because I couldn't see a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because there's a, a lot of smoke. And then there were times when he saw probably a little more than he had bargained for. It's surprising the amount of, sort of sex scenes and everything there are yeah. it, it, it's also you you have to get a, a, a sort of good bedside manner on the show like this yeah. and we're talking about soap opera coverage in mm -hmm. the sense that you need to see each person so so more often than other people i have been the other side of a lovemaking couple oh my god i mean i i have many a memory of doing a love scene with simon with simon that's so <laughs> with, funny and with jim simon when presumably yeah. i mean jim's there and you know ryan's there as well but yeah i mean it, but it's also it hadn't actually occurred to me because it's one of the aspects of this job yeah. That is sort of normal yeah. once you're an actor, right? Yeah. So I had never even considered it that it might be weird for someone looking in it. But luckily, you know, Simon is such a lovely, supportive and safe presence. And I felt safe with him with my image in his hand. Right. So, yeah, it all it all kind of worked with him, him in the mix. Mostly we caught up with such a good friend. Yeah. And we're just proud to hear that warm feelings about the set that we've heard from everyone we've interviewed, cast, crew, yeah. writers and directors over and over again, extend to Simon as well. It's a that a, a regular problem for a camera operator is falling in love. <laughs> but <laughs> it's you stare at someone all day and of stuff course, like that. So that's yeah. just yeah. that happens. There are a few of those, but yeah, it 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 was it was great, and it was uh, as we got more and more seasons under our belt that we were beginning to say at the end, like, "So have you been here from the beginning?" And the, and there was a lot. There were a lot of people that were. I think yeah, it was wow. out of the entire crew. I think like fifty four people, oh did, beginning gosh. to end. That's Which you know, incredible. for people may not know, that's a big number for, especially yeah. for a show that was this difficult. I yeah. think. And and then the, the other thing is, I mean, it, it, it as far as a crew and just 
I guess the time it was shot and everything there was there was an alchemy that that I don't see on other shows for sure for sure and I'm always the first I'm, I, I I I truly have never kept in contact with as many people from a crew from all yeah. departments all departments actors and and everything yes. else I mean I I speak to a lot of people all the time and yeah. It's it, it, and I'm going to say this right now. It's it's of any job that I've done. It's the closest bond with cast and crew that I had on any show. And I don't know that it was just that that's what happens when it's cold <laughs> and at night. <laughs> <laughs> Even with all of the laughs and that family feeling that we had on set, you know, I think we still wanted to know like what keeps him coming back. You know, despite. Right the cold and the long hours and the overnights and the challenging storylines. I mean, what makes him one of the 54 people who decided to stay? Yeah. I never got bored. It, it was kind of strange. I've, I've done many shows where we've had constant standing sets mm -hmm. and there were very few that I got bored with over <laughs> seven years, which is, amazing kind of unheard of because hmm. you you, you it, it's very easy to shoot a set out as far as the every permutation of where a camera will go right and, and we certainly did that but we were always doing so many different things in true blood so you could have mm -hmm. the same set like so the the, the stack house like changed from the the main ad set that where they made it uh it, 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 it had like horses heads so, yes. Yes. and stuff in it and, and so so you're never doing the same kind of thing in it and and we did that with with bill's house there was yeah. like the old bill's house and some different eras of it and fire there was like a big one in there yeah. uh and and so those things were always like super interesting and never got bored mm. uh, it, wow. it, it, it was great I'm gonna yeah. cry again. <laughs> I can't even. Thank you, Simon. I mean, yeah, just to Simon, you you made this show, and we are just, I think, honored that we have the ability with this podcast to share with everyone listening your enormous contribution to not only True Blood, but as we said, this industry as a whole. Because yeah. Simon has done all of the shows literally brought the technology and still remains just a professional and funny funny charming and person thank you simon we adore you well i am ecstatic to introduce you all to romeo tarone he was our dp on the show for almost all seven years i think all seven years and then directed a number of episodes as well throughout the series and just a yeah. fixture of the show i cannot imagine this show without him and the show Thank wouldn't you. be what it was visually energetically without yes. him so i can't wait to share with you all what he had to yes. say hi romeo romeo <laughs> oh my god the most beautiful women I've ever shot. Oh, <laughs> Romeo, I can't even believe that is true with it's all of so the work true. that you've done. But it's it so lovely to see you. I know, and I don't oh, care. It's so great seeing it you guys. It, I love hearing that. That's the thing. He knows. <laughs> he, he knows. knows. This, is, this is why I love <laughs> Romeo so much. I mean, I mean, we're already into the interview because, like, it's so fascinating doing these interviews. And, and for so many reasons, but one of them is that I yeah. get to learn what y'all <laughs> did. Like, I don't know, you know what I mean? It's, we each do our piece and you're not talking to me about my backstory right. and Pam, you know, what I'm is going on in my head. And I'm not asking you about your preparation and what the heck <laughs> you do over there and how you know <laughs> lenses or whatever. You know, so when we get to interview people, I become so fascinated. I mean, I Googled. <laughs> you know, That's fine. so yeah. I guess I'll start there because I want people to know the scope of how I mean, there is no television. What people are watching 
is literally yeah. the work of the cinematographer. That's literally what they're staring at. So we're, what people mm -hmm. see is yeah. the actor. But you don't see the actor if... <laughs> if we don't get you in the box. <laughs> in the box. Not, uh... <laughs> yeah. You can clarify this, but it seems to me that of a lot of the jobs on set, cinematographer is one of the biggest crossover. You work yes. with more departments yeah. and have to collaborate Absolutely. in that way. And, and, and I have ways. to say, it was yeah. a great yeah. reading ground for me as far as to, I think I've always wanted to direct, but I yes. kind of got into cinematography because I had an eye and I just, you know, that was my path. Yes. But I, I sometimes now, because I direct all, all the time now, I can't even see how a director could direct without having been a cinematographer before. Yes. Ah, uh, interesting. It, it, it's running the set, especially like, you know, I my first television show was Dexter, and then I went right on to True Blood. I did right. Dexter and True Blood simultaneously. I remember that. It was crazy. Dexter would let me go an episode early, and I would get to True Blood. Then next season, True Blood would let me start a day, wow. uh, an episode later. And it was such a beautiful symbiotic thing that they did for me that I was able to work both shows throughout wow. those years. It wow. was like I had like 15 years of television oh uh, experience in that compact seven years. I think I was with everybody. Oh my god! Yes, no break. <laughs> I wanted for the audience to understand, so I googled this and cinematographer or director of photography called DP <laughs> DOP is the person responsible for the photographing or recording of a film, television product, production, music video, other live action piece. So it could mm -hmm. be a concert, right? When people watch concerts on TV, the cinematographer is the chief of the camera and light crews and would be responsible for making artistic and technical decisions related to the image and for selecting the camera, film stock, lenses, filters. The cinematographer is subordinate to the director, tasked with capturing a scene in accordance with the director's vision. So that is so interesting that you just said, how does someone direct not having been a cinematographer? And then you are a director and a cinematographer. So on True Blood, I have questions about what it was like working with different directors yeah. and their different styles. There, there was so many directors that I worked with on True Blood that were so great. They were all fantastic. Yes, and I yes. learned something from everyone. As a cinematographer yes. coming in, I came okay. in in the middle of season one. Uh -huh. I had to break because of the writer's strike yep. and then one of the cinematographers left and then they, yes. they needed a new cinematographer. And I was very lucky that Marco Siega was directing the episode. Yeah. And he called me up and said, hey, we need a cinematographer, you wanna do this? And I was like, oh my God, of course. <laughs> That's how Is it that happened how it for happens? me. It was like I tried to get an interview with Alan Ball when I heard huh. that there was an opening and I couldn't get an interview. My phone rang and it was Marcos and I'll always no, pick up Marcos kidding. call. And he said, do you want to do it? And I went, yep, right there. And then I was doing burning. I think it's called burning house, burning down the house yeah. or burning house burning, of love. Burning house of love. Yeah. Burning which, house of love. Which we went yes. to Shreveport with. Like it was yeah. amazing. Like all the things that we did with that. And I, I just remember sitting in the first production meeting and the scope of it. So yeah. instead of thinking of how, how right. economical I can make this, it, this was always about how can we do the best thing we possibly can do and how can wow. we top ourselves? And that's why those meetings would go on and on sometimes oh. and we would just all spitball ideas and trying to figure out how we were going to do blood drops. And a lot of stuff was worked out, but every time we came up to a new season and oh. something new happened, like transitions yeah. from werewolves to werepanthers and all that, yeah. it was always like spoken to in, in minutia yeah. detail. Uh, in the production meetings. Well, it's fascinating. It's almost like you have to simultaneously use both sides of your brain because that's problem solving and it's artistry because you're looking to how yes. to tell a story but also get the thing done that's impossible to do. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that with, is amazing. With cinematography, especially working with different directors, yeah. you're you're the emo I always feel you're the emotional kind of track to it. So the way I show somebody's close up, whether it's a uh, long yeah. lens or a wide yeah. lens, it's going to do something to the audience whether they know it's happening or not yes and that's and once you understand right. you start seeing that like you can look at a, a location and a set and you start seeing the shots that you want to yeah. do and then understand after you've read the script of what we're trying to communicate certain directors are very uh -huh. visually oriented so yeah. they're they understand that i want a shot here i want to do this and this and then other directors are all about the actors I'm just dealing with performance. They'll turn to you and say, okay, what are we doing next? Uh -huh. So as a cinematographer, you have to shape uh -huh. yourself to fit that director. And we have a new director, like every yeah. every episode you have a different director. 
Uh, and we're lucky. We on True Blood, we had a right. stable of directors that kept yeah. coming back. Michael Layman, you know Scott yeah. Wynett, yeah. all wonderful, great, great directors. Oh, Stan yeah. Minahan. Like I, I learned yeah. so much with their co collaboration oh. with them that helped me as a director. You know, it's it's amazing. It says here in the infancy of motion pictures, the cinematographer was usually also the director and the person physically handling the camera. But as the art form and technology evolved, a separation between director and camera operator emerged. Then with the advent of artificial lighting, faster, more sensitive light film, uh, sensitive film, the technical aspects of cinematography necessitated a specialist. And then eventually in 1919, your union was formed. And this is their definition, a creative and interpretive process that culminates in the authorship of an original work of art rather than the simple recording of a physical Absolutely. event. Absolutely, yes. That's the art of cinematography. Absolutely. And we all feel it every day. People right? feel it in their own TikToks, in their own yeah, visual. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. understand angles now, and everyone starts understanding where the light is better, where, where, you know, if I do a longer lens, I look nicer than if I do a wide lens, it makes my nose bigger and all stuff like that, which everyone's now really right. tuned into. So cinematography is no longer an art that's kind of hidden under the surface. Everyday people understand uh -huh. it now. So when they watch something, they immediately have that sense of this is good. This is not good. And you don't right. understand why, but now all of a sudden, oh, uh -huh. this looks flat. The light looks flat. There's no character to the light. The light's not telling me a story. There's always right. like Victoria right. Storaro is one of the greatest cinematographers has always said there always has to be a battle of light and dark on a face. <gasps> you, you have to always see the dichotomy right. of what's happening. And True Blood was the best example of that because huh. we always worked with half light. We yeah. always worked yeah. with this, this horror genre kind of lighting, but then there was this certain realism to make the characters come to life. And yes. You know, when we would read the script, sometimes I would look at the lines and go, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? Like, <laughs> hey, just the too. lines that, yeah, <laughs> no, no, too, but, Romeo, yeah. But, but the quality of the actors that were on True Blood, that they sold every line, that every line, as campy as it could be, yeah. or as bizarre, you know, mm -hmm. it, they sold right. it. And, and, and that selling right. of it made everyone suspend their disbelief yeah. and really just come with us. And I, I could not believe it. When we were on it, we knew it was something yeah. special. It's well, so curious, great. I'm curious about that because yeah. working on a show that has genre elements or thematics that are a little bit larger than life, that must still take a very specific vision. Do you feel like you have a style that you bring or is your job to match the tone of the piece or to try to match the director's? I mean, what, it, how does It's interesting. As a in? cinematographer, yes, you, you, you bring in your style. Yeah. Um, there's different ways. And sometimes you're chosen because they see something sure. in your reel that, you know, makes them think, oh, yeah, this is the he this person is the person that's going to be able to capture this. Right. But it's it's a it's a group mm -hmm. effort. Like it's just someone who's gonna be like if you're on a boat sailing somewhere, that someone's gonna be in charge of that. Okay, I'm yeah. gonna be in charge of navigation and I'm gonna get us through this no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what cinematography becomes. You become the navigator, you become the huh. person that says, Okay, let's shoot it this way, mm -hmm. right from location scouting. I think location scouting and prep work is the most important part. Yeah. of making any any show or telling any story, any, any movies, sh TV shows. Yeah. So once you look at a location and you say, okay, we're going to shoot here. And the director says, oh, I want to shoot against this wall. And you're like, well, why don't you shoot against the windows? Because the light will be nicer. Okay. And so once you, you learn the trust to understand that you're not just switching things to make it look nicer superficially, but for the audience to understand mm -hmm. emotionally what's going on with the actors. Yeah. Again, yeah. someone in a half light, darker, mm -hmm. no fill light, there's something brooding going on, you know, right. brighter, flat, you know, happier mm -hmm. exteriors. Um, that's, that's like, you know, a flatter light, but it's, it's more communicating, you know, the happiness or whatever you're, you're feeling like that. And that, that, that's mm -hmm. uh, an ongoing discussion that the cinematographer and the director has as they're creating. And in, mm -hmm. in case of television, the writer is the real, Ahead uh, right. of that medium. So, mm -hmm. as far as moving uh, the cameras around and see how much movement there's going to be, or there are certain styles in 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 the show. Yeah. Like I, I feel like True Blood was classic. You know, we always had things on dollies, and we always yeah. made really beautiful moves, and we utilized cranes, and we yeah. we we utilized everything that was at our fingertips to 
to be able to tell the story. And it wasn't like, okay, we're just going to be handheld for handheld sake. You know, it was always, there was a reason yes. why we did everything. Right. I can't stand that. That became a style at some point to handheld yeah. and wiggle the camera on purpose. Yeah. It makes me nauseous. Now, and, and was that on True Blood? Was that a decision based partly on the fact that you had so much support and all those days to shoot so you could do classic? Yes. Yeah, I guess only. so. I, I mean, having all those days, uh -huh. I always see it as like, oh my God, we got all this to do. And and we, you know, it's still like we still have 14 hour days that we got to still do, which, you know, I think is a thing of, a thing of yes. the past now, yeah. um, because, uh, again, after right. COVID and all that, and, you know, can it just to work people that hard yeah. is, is so hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a vampire show is nice, it's hard. you know, yeah. and you're going to have to do a lot of, of, yes. of stuff that, you know, cost a lot more because you're yeah. doing it all at night. Um, but yeah, the, the idea that. Right because we were on HBO and we were a really big show, it wasn't like, okay, how can we get this the cheapest and fastest way? Mm -hmm. It was never that. It was always like, okay, mm -hmm. this is our style. This is what we need to do. It's going to take X amount of time to do this. And mm -hmm. we were allotted that time. That's the beauty of True Blood, mm -hmm. I think, because we were given the time to do it. Like, wow. you know, I've never heard of any other show going 21 days for an no. episode. I mean, crazy. I remember yeah. the number of takes that, as an actor, one got the number of setups, mm -hmm. the number of times we went through a scene, we really yeah. shot the crap out of that stuff, you know? Right. I don't and, know and if we always had yeah. we always had a large cast. It wasn't yeah. like only one or two people. There was always a lot of people. So yeah. I mean, a lot it, of became, coverage. it became like a, a, a play, like watching a play, yeah. one act play all the time. It was really so mm -hmm. let me ask you then. So you're talking, I mean, I it sounds like prep, location, all that work, you're figuring out your angles, the space, the lighting and everything. And then you get to set and then you have mm -hmm. 50 more people <laughs> who have things that they have to do, props that have to go in certain places, actors who say, oh, I, it doesn't feel right to sit there or what is. Mm -hmm. So there's still a flexibility that has to be present. How, again, yes. how does that collaboration work? How do you on the fly? Sometimes that's where the cream really rises to the huh. top because you can have all these ideas that are kind of in a box of like, this is what it is. And it's never that. So once the <laughs> yeah. actors come on and they they make a nuance, I want to turn this way. Not even yeah. I want to. I shouldn't say that because that seems yeah. like it's itself. You know, it's it's very much just you know I just want to do this. No. But the instincts, you know, the actors have instincts, and once they're in the scene, they're the only ones in the scene. Yeah. Everyone else is outside the scene. So we're making right. all our decisions based on being outside the scene, where the actors are inside the scene and their their feelings of like I think I want to move here and everything. We, you always have to, at least I feel as a director yeah. and a cinematographer, you always have to let the have that freedom because those are going to be the moments that are going to be the really, really interesting moments that no one could ever thought of. I think the that kind of classic style that we we shot in, which was like you know you do the master, then you come in do everyone's you know close ups, and people would get takes, and if you wanted another take, you would get it. There was no yeah. kind of like gotta get going, gotta get going yeah. to everyone. So there was that right. responsibility of doing the best you could. Yeah. And as a cinematographer, I always tried to make sure that there was always room for people to move around. It wasn't like, oh, you got to stay here yeah. and you can't go here. Because I, I understood that capturing right. that energy, that's the moments that made things great. Listen, because I mean, I've worked with some, like, both, both extremes of those, right? So I've worked with people who are so rigid that I am quite literally just the puppet in the frame that has to sit and turn and do exactly what works for the shot that they've made. And I get worse which means it's a mm -hmm. worse shot and a worse, you know, right. story and everything. And the freedom right. that we had on True Blood, I just remember you, the director, Simon, you know, whoever was sort of, mm -hmm. kept, you guys Simon. would see things right. that, frankly, for me, my whole thing was like, I'm in a documentary, right? Like, I'm just going to come out here and do this thing. And if you need me to move two inches mm -hmm. to the left, fine, that's not a problem. But like, I'm going to sort of live this thing and I'm going to trust the brilliance of you all to capture it and and you would find little things and i would notice like oh that camera's coming around there energy shift or whatever it is and it became this dance mm -hmm. and because of that faith dance. and that sense of like oh they're actually really watching and taking in what we're doing and adjusting for it when a director or yourself or simon or whoever it was had an idea for something really cool that was more preset i was like how can i help you know like what can i do to make that vision come true right. for you because you have right. done so much and been so flexible for me so i 
Again, I, we talk about how True Blood ruined us because yeah. it's just not like that anywhere else. It's so know? true. It ruined all of us. It yeah. Really <laughs> one thing I must say, True Blood was shot on film. Yes. Okay. Probably Please, one of the last talk, shows. I have a whole yeah. thing. Right? Oh, that's a, yeah. One of the last shows shot on film. We were exposing yeah. mm-hmm. negative Ridiculous. film. We would have, you know, four minutes in our 400 foot mags, 10 minutes in our <laughs> thousand foot mags. And, you know, you couldn't just roll on and on. It was an expensive <sighs> process. And it wasn't something that you can look at the monitor and see exactly what you got, which is happening now. So there was this mystery that would always pop up at the end. Like, you know, we would all have these little monitors and and see things, but no one actually knew. The cinematographer had an idea of what it's going to look like, but no one actually knew once it got through the process what it really is going to look like. That's the experience of a cinematographer. So I would never sleep at night. I'd go to bed and I'd go (laughs) toss and turn. And then I'd hear my phone would ding and I'd have the guy who's doing the dailies, he would send me stills. And I would, oh, good. Because then True Blood, we were a dark show. So sometimes you'd yeah. go dark, you know, and you want to like, you know, you'd, you'd have this weird feeling in your stomach saying, oh, God, I don't know. But it always that was where the best work would come from. So to be able to shoot film on that level in that many years, I was just one of the luckiest people. And in True Blood, we were really filmmakers, which was wonderful. Can you talk to us for a minute about like when you said never sleep at night, because so much happens before the actor walks in the set and then so much happens after. I I have to say Alan Ball's style was uh, as soon as the director came, they got the script the night before or whatever. They come into his office and we'd have the tone meeting. The first thing the director would do is have a tone meeting with Alan, which was amazing. Every other show does a tone meeting at the end. We oh. did the tone meeting in the beginning oh. so that Alan would go through the script at a really, you know, detailed level of what his expectations were and what, you know, he was thinking of and how it would be. So the director would be completely informed okay. on what Alan's point of view of everything right. was before we went in there. We would take a 20 minute break oh. and then we go into the concept meeting. That's when you have all the department heads and you start. Huh cutting it up and you start saying, okay, we're going to do this. This is going to be here. This is going to be on location. This is going to be in studio. We have to figure out how to kill this vampire. We have to figure out how to fly these people through the air. This is VFX. We've got to blow people up. Yeah. Yeah. And we break it all down to what's VFX, what's special effects. And we break that all down. That's the concept meeting. So you'd have makeup, wardrobe, you'd have all the department heads going, all right, you know, this is going to be, because I remember Bridget Ellis, head of makeup would be, trying to figure out Mm -hmm. how we're going to do the blood, you know, and at a certain point, (laughs) I always laugh when I watch the show because there's no blood on our face. Like a a vampire explodes. We we would get some on your face. face. (laughs) But but that's much harder for continuity. We would get a little bit more noticeable. No, no, the worst worst possible (laughs) thing is all you crybaby vampires crying blood all the time. Me all the time. Oh my God. (laughs) Because you had to start the tears, real tears, yep, right? Real tears. And we had to pause, and then they would put the fake, you know, uh, blood tears in, so we didn't have to VFX through on your yep, face the yes. whole thing. It was that was, I have to say, yes. probably one of the most continuity. And then it was, and I, I can't remember early on. It might have been you, Deborah. Why yeah, was a nightmare? Became yeah. a thing. So that yep. you didn't have to worry about the perfect oh, strike. Yes. And it would just be like always wiping. And it could it. just live there for a little bit. So yeah. yeah, that became And a, you didn't have to worry solution. about the continuity. Exactly. Yeah, because no, it would it kind of dry there. But also for myself, ah. who's, you know, my complexion is so I'm, I'm clear, basically. Yes. You know, <laughs> that blood would stain. So yes. I remember even things of saying like, even just for blood oh. tears, we would do the, all right, let's shoot it up until the tears and then mm-hmm. shoot that out. Then we'll come after the tears because we might not be able yeah. to get the blood off of Deborah's yeah. right. face. For I always felt that cinematography was more of a martial art in the sense that it was mm-hmm. about the movement of everything on the set, not just what was in the box. It's not just the result. The art wasn't just the result. Right. It was all the right. movement. It's like watching a concert or watching some sort of dancing. And once you got it right, momentum would constantly go. There was nothing really stopping the momentum. And we had a lot of uh, stop and goes, right? Yeah, which you guys yeah. know, right? Okay, ready? Yes. And now fangs in, yeah. right. and you put the fangs in and you repeat <laughs> the back. actual motion, yes. you know, do the same thing again. <laughs> And and, right. and and there was so many things, blood, we do everything of a scene, a really complicated 12 handed scene that has, you know, like five minutes of dialogue in it, right? Yeah. And we have to do everything up to the blood. Yeah. And we do all the angles and then we do yes. everything after, after the blood. The because blood. once the blood came down, it was a sono tube right. full of 
of goo that yes. once the vampire got popped, we'd splash it all over. The there was no going back. Yeah. No going back. <laughs> Very complicated as as to plan it out, but we yeah. always got through it. We, we did yeah. it. So that then we get onto the set and oh, you know what I loved? The mm. read throughs. True Blood was probably mm. one of the last shows uh-huh. that I did that he did that did a read through every episode. Yeah. So this is why we're here. This is this uh. is the story we're telling. This is the voices that we're going to be hearing. And it was it always made things so much more special because yeah. of understanding that. And you're in your prep and you're like, "Okay, this is like game day." It was so yes. valuable. Then you get on the set and now it's like all these things that you planned, like you got, "Okay, there's going to be a light over there." And you watch the first run through, like with the director would have a private rehearsal, which I would always be involved in. I'd be yeah. able to be a fly on the wall in that. And then immediately as it as it starts yeah. happening, sometimes I would have an idea of like, okay, I'd be looking in this direction. But then when I start seeing the action, it's like, oh no, it's going to be in this direction. Mm. And and you have to be that nimble to uh. be able to change things on a dime uh, so that you can accommodate the greatness that is in front of you. Well, we're we're in season two with the Fellowship of the Sun stuff. And apparently that church scene oh is God. just, you guys were there for days and yes. the scene is 10 minutes long and it's got 40 people in it. The Church of the Sun, right? The yeah, t- Fellowship yeah. of the Sun. Yeah. We went to, yeah. I forgot what area in LA it is, but it's on this hill in a cemetery. And, and it has this beautiful window. And the sunlight, the sun sets and it comes right through it. So we yeah. based everything on shooting the actual sun. So yeah. there's a moment where uh, Michael opens the doors and we push in and the sun is just blasting through that. And it's all the real sun and it's no visual effects. And it, it was probably one of my best moments as a cinematographer to be able to <laughs> capture that. Yeah. And be able to still wow. tell the story and still be able to do that. And yeah, we had so many things going on there at night, yeah. that yeah. whole church area. But that was great. So another question is, when you think of your experience on True Blood, what are three words that come to mind? Oh, my God. Transforming in the sense of it transformed my career from mm-hmm. what I was doing. And I just really felt like I was part of the show, a show. Like I was in this upper area. Refinement. I, because of working yeah. that hard for that many years, it refined my skills as a cinematographer and as a director and enjoyment. Yes. Mm-hmm. I literally love to go to work. Oh. There was even as hard as it was, even as like, yes. oh, God, this is going to be miserable. Going to work, I, I would whistle while I work because mm-hmm. it, it was just such a wonderful place to be. I agree. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Romeo. Well, you are just such uh, a joy. It's been such a pleasure reliving oh. this. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's such a pleasure. The greatest. Thanks, Romeo. Deb, do I say this every time that that's my favorite interview? Um, you do as well as I do. I think you and I are very of the moment. But I get so excited <laughs> after every single one of these. I think one thing yeah. to really nail home for people listening When we do these interviews with people that you don't know necessarily, might not Mm -hmm. be as familiar with, Mm -hmm. they feel as as big a part of the show and as influential on the show, integral as the Alex Mm -hmm. Skarsgårds and the Anna Paquins and the, you know, Steve Moyers. Yeah. Those, you know, Romeo is as big a part of this series as any one of the actors or Alan Ball, the names that you know. So for us, it's exciting in that way. And I, I hope you can feel through these interviews yeah. really the impact that they have because Romeo was there every day yeah. on the episodes that he either directed or DOP. Yeah. I worked with him more than Alex Garthgard, right? Like Me, I worked with right, him quite right. a you know, bit more. Right. Um, Me too. And that's, that's really, it, it's such a, an interesting relationship that maybe doesn't get enough spotlight sometimes. Yeah. Like Simon Jay's was yeah. there every, every time day. I walked there onto that set. I mean, 99.9% of the scenes that we did on True Blood, we did with Simon. Yeah. Which is extraordinary. He is the main scene partner of all of our lives. (laughs) I know. The best people. Next week on Truest Blood, it's all about the hormones. (laughs) Everyone is getting hot and heavy across the South. Whether it's Bon Temps or Dallas, these Southern Bells just gotta have it. 
and we'll speak with the ultimate Southern Belle, Anna Camp. You love her as Sarah Newland, and her work from Broadway to the big screen is extraordinary. Whether singing her heart out or staking vampires in theirs, she always manages to win ours. So save a true blood for this one. It's going to be a hot time. Thanks for listening, Trubies. Subscribe and follow wherever you listen to your podcasts, and we'll see you next week. Y'all come back now, you heal. Got any burning questions you want answered on Truest Blood? Post them on any and all social media platforms using hashtag fan club questions, and we may feature them on the show. That's hashtag F-A-N-G-C-L-U-B-Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N-S. Truest Blood is produced by Safe Haven for HBO Max. Executive producers are Janina Gavonkar, Kristen Bauer, and Deborah Ann Wool. Our producer is Gabrielle Gallon, and our audio producer is Christopher Wool. Our theme song was recorded just for this podcast by Jace Everett. Additional music was composed by Timo Chen. And remember, you can watch all of the original episodes of True Blood on HBO Max. Hey.